Uh, I am TJ Donovan, Vermont's Attorney General. Thank you, Tish James. Thank you, Carl Racine. On off, on off. Well, that concludes my remarks. <laughs> Uh, hey, I want to welcome everybody uh, to the Queen City, Burlington, Vermont. It's taken me 47 years, but I now know how it feels to be cool and hip. Because let me tell you something, last night, everybody kept on coming up to me. First of all, let me just point out that across the lake is Tish James' jurisdiction. That's New York. That's not, not, that's not Vermont. General James, thanks for being here. <clears throat> Thank you, General. But everybody kept on coming up to me last night saying, where do we go to dinner? We can't get a reservation. I felt like, you know, I was in the coolest, hottest, hippest city in the world, you know, giving recommendations for folks to go. Uh, my list, you know, here's the only problem. I haven't been out in 18 months, so I don't know where to go anymore. Uh, so I hope folks had a wonderful night. Uh, I do want to welcome everybody here to Burlington uh, for the NAG conference on the surveillance economy. And I want to thank Chris Toth and the team at NAG uh, for putting this conference together. Uh, in particular, I want to give a shout out to Emily Parsons from NAG for her hard work in organizing this. And I want to thank uh, in advance the hardest working people in the room and that is the Hilton staff who are going to help us throughout these next two days. So thank you. Uh, I want to thank my team in particular, uh, Charity Clark, my chief of staff, uh, and others uh, for helping to organize this. This was their idea, and if it was a good idea, it's their idea. If it was a bad idea, it's mine. Uh, so thank you, Charity, and the folks from the Vermont Attorney General's office. And I want to thank my, fr my friends and colleagues who are here. We have my great friend, the incomparable William Tong from Connecticut. And we have the original TJ, Tish James from the great state of New York. We... <laughs> We have Carl Racine from the District of Columbia. And I want to, I just want to, I want to thank Carl uh, and his team in NAG for putting on really just a tremendously inspiring uh, conference uh, last week, the presidential initiative that was held in Washington, D.C., uh, Carl's initiative about combating hate. Uh, it was substantive, uh, and Carl, I don't say this often, it was inspiring. Uh, so we thank you for your great work and leading us on this important issue. Thank you, Carl. I know uh, she may be here later. I think she is virtual this morning from Massachusetts. General Healy, Maura Healy, thanks for coming. All the way, our eastern neighbor, my closest neighbor, General Camacho from Guam is here. And I want to introduce and give a warm welcome, a Vermont welcome and a nag welcome to the new kid on the block, New Hampshire's Attorney General, John Formella. John, where are you? Please stand up. <laughs> we welcome you to the family. Uh, we're, we got a great conference. Uh, these are incredibly important issues. We have wonderful uh, panelists uh, and even better, we've dialed up, I think, just incredible weather over these next two days. You are on the shores of beautiful Lake Champlain, uh, two blocks east, headed up the hill. I think I sent many of you that way last night, is Church Street with a lot of uh, shops, restaurants, bars. Please go up there. Uh, one block down, of course, is the waterfront with uh, more restaurants and shops. There's a great bike path uh, that I know many of you uh, went for a run or a walk on. Uh, if you head a little bit south uh, in, in Burlington, this is what we call the Pine Street Corridor, you're going to see uh, more restaurants and more breweries. So please get out and explore Burlington and the surrounding areas today. Uh, I know I was talking to a few of you. Uh, it is probably peak foliage season right now. 
uh, in Vermont, and please ask uh, many of us uh, what roads to travel. And the road less traveled in Vermont often is the one where you're gonna find a traffic jam uh, this week in Vermont. Uh, but if you wanna be stunned, if you wanna be inspired, uh, get out on the road and drive throughout Vermont. Uh, there's a fellow in here who can probably give you the best directions, and that's former Attorney General Bill Sorrell, who's here. Bill, thanks for being here with us this morning. <clears throat> so in addition to uh, this conference and the conversations we'll have this morning, uh, NAG has put together a wonderful reception for tonight uh, at Hotel Vermont, which is just around the corner. Uh, I think it's gonna be outside on the patio. Uh, listen, there may not be a better night to be in Vermont. Uh, it's gonna be warm, it's gonna be sunny. Uh, you may have some leaves dropping down. It's gonna get a little chilly at night. We may have a fire pit, we're gonna have good food. May have, maybe you have something warm in your glass. Uh, as my father would say, it's gonna be a nice night for an evening. So please join us uh, here tonight. Uh, it's incredibly, incredible uh, for me to host this conference uh, here in Burlington. I grew up in Burlington and I grew up about six blocks uh, down the road from here. And uh, Burlington was a different place back then, Bill, and I'm not, I don't, I don't wanna age myself, but it was, it, was, uh, it was a different place than what it is today. Uh, and we've certainly evolved and progressed in so many ways in this city, in this state, in this country, but Growing up uh, down the road in the south end of Burlington, I used to work at this corner store that doesn't exist anymore on the corner of St. Paul Street and Howard Street called Lodge Brothers Meat Market. And these places don't exist much anymore. It really was this community gathering place where everybody would come, uh, particularly on a Sunday morning. It was a meeting spot. You had the very wealthy, you had the very poor, you had the middle class, you had the working class, you had everybody who came. And I was lucky enough to work there uh, as a young guy uh, and work for a fellow by the name of Mr. V. Mr. V had two rules. Customer's always right, treat everybody with respect. And it, Carl it probably was, and Tish was probably the best political education I've ever received because you interacted with people from all walks of life and you began to understand people. And to just, if you could talk to folks and some folks like to talk a little bit more than others, uh, but it was a wonderful place to work. And Mr. V had a system. He didn't take any credit cards. He had a system of credit where you would run credit on the back of a cigarette carton, interest-free. He never sent out a bill. People paid what they could when they could, but they always paid. And folks would come in as a young guy at 16, 17 years old. I didn't quite understand it. Folks would come into the store, get some food for dinner, and you'd run the credit on the back of a cigarette carton. Never a bill, no credit, no computer. Trust. Man, we're a far way away from the corner of St. Paul Street and Howard. Because if I was thinking about Mr. V this morning, would he have, ins would he have insurance for a cyber attack? Would he know what to do if he had to notify or who to notify if there was a data breach? How would he protect his customer's privacy? Would he even know or be engaged that perhaps that information, that data that he was collecting was being bought and sold? And did he have an obligation to tell his consumers that? Did he have to register and understand whether or not he would qualify as a data broker under Vermont law? What would it mean for a customer of his to know that whether or not they could opt in or perhaps opt out of this system of big data? The world has changed rapidly. Technology has outpaced the law, no question about it. And the question that we're gonna confront in this room is simply this, can the law keep up? Can the role of the Attorney General that chief law enforcement officer charged with protecting consumers, charged with protecting children, charged with making sure that the marketplace is a fair and equitable marketplace, engage in this new economy that is moving so rapidly where folks like Mr. V, his shop doesn't exist anymore 
but how do we protect that consumer who may now be doing their shopping online, who may not ever qualify for credit worthiness, who may not understand to be sophisticated to enter into a marketplace of cryptocurrency and to understand what that is and whether or not they could be at risk of being scammed. We're also gonna explore what does it mean? What does privacy actually mean in this digital age? You know, you're in a state that, and I know General Sorrell would agree with this, that this notion of privacy, it's part of our DNA in Vermont. It's who we are. It's embedded in our culture. In fact, it's embedded in our, sta in our state constitution. And trying to draw and define those rights is becoming increasingly difficult. We know technology is a good thing. We know that the only constant is change and that for a small rural state like Vermont in order to compete in a global economy, we have to be nimble, we have to be flexible, we have to be willing to engage in this new economy as a government. But how do you take those pillars of consumer protection? How do you take those pillars of making sure that we're protecting kids and infuse them in this new legal framework as we continue to navigate a 21st century economy. I don't have all the answers. I know many folks in the room do. So we look forward to a robust conversation, a collaborative conversation, as we seek to find answers on behalf of consumers, on behalf of kids, as we continue these next two days in this conversation. And I just wanna close by saying that it really is that incredible honor and privilege to be with my colleagues like William Tish and Carl and Levin and others in the AG community. And it, it's quite amazing for somebody who grew up in the South End to be in a room like this uh, with you all today to be down in Washington with Carl and folks last week to go through the halls of power of Congress and at times be able to visit the White House. But my worldview, I still look through that lens of Laundry Brothers Market, of folks coming in and perhaps didn't have the money at the time to feed their family, who worked all day, who were coming home just looking to take care of their family. And to go to a place where they were not judged, but were accepted, were respected, and were helped. And that's my worldview. That's, what I, that's the worldview I've tried to bring to the Attorney General's office. That's the worldview I bring to this conversation with you all today. I look forward to this. Thank you for being in Burlington. Let's have a great conference. Okay, well listen, we're already behind schedule. That's the bad news. Uh, let me, uh, hey listen, you're in Vermont. We do things a little bit different here, as you know. So, we have a New York Times reporter, Kashmir Hill, who is with us this morning. But here's the thing, she's not gonna interview us. I've asked Carl Racine to interview Miss Hill about these issues and her groundbreaking, her groundbreaking work on these issues of privacy. And so with that, let me ask General Racine and Ms. Hill to take the stage and let's get started. Yeah, TJ's with me. Owes you how much? <laughs> All right. Let me get settled here. Good morning, everybody. All right. Really great to see everyone there. And let me just say, um, I don't know. 
uh, if there is a um, you know more uh, authentic, uh, decent, deep, uh, intelligent, loving, caring, um, and you know just overwhelmingly decent uh, human being uh, who I've met in my nearly seven years as Attorney General uh, in this entire AG room uh, than T.J. Donovan. Um, he is a truth speaker. Uh, he's a sensitive, caring, loving human being. Uh, and I think he's um, the right leader for so many opportunities, including his current um, job uh, as Attorney General. So TJ, thank you so much for hosting us. Um, uh, and to the room, it's really nice to be back in physical presence uh, with everyone and certainly appreciate everybody exercising their own personal uh, choice with respect to masking uh, inside um, and even outside or not. Uh, we all have to do what we need to do in order to keep our families safe um, and we should be respected um, for those uh, choices. I do want to um, take maybe five seconds to ask my team to stand up. My Chief Deputy Jason Downs, it's really important to... <laughs> Yeah, it's important to know these folks because uh, they, they really do all the work and they, they perform at such a high level. And they've been you know, denied in light of the pandemic, uh, the opportunity to engage and interact and get to know many of you. And Jason, I think, uh, is just an extraordinary lawyer. I'm not going to get into any fights here um, about being the, chief deputy, the best chief deputy in the country, but I just said it. Um, Emily Gunston is a great lawyer uh, in my office. She's a senior counsel. And um, we travel large in D.C., so we also brought our consumer protection privacy ace, Lindsey Marks. There you go. Excellent. Um, so look, this is going to be about 45, 42 minutes of a conversation around, um, you know, really important privacy issues. And it is a little odd, right, an elected official having a discussion, not, in, not really an interview, uh, with the New York uh, Times reporter. Um, but you will know, uh, if you don't know now, at the end of the session, why we are lucky to have Kashmir Hill with us, Kashmir Hill with us. Uh, she has been a reporter and focusing on tech and privacy issues uh, since about 2009. She's currently, of course, at the New York Times, but has written previously for Forbes and a whole bunch of other of publications. I think my favorite uh, was your blog. What was the name of your blog back in 2009? The Not So Private Parts. The, hey, hey. <laughs> I some, like puns. <laughs> <laughs> some people would put an R after that <laughs> title, but all good. Um, I have to say that her writing around the subject that we're going to talk about, her writings and research and investigation, are, you know, in my view, um, the most powerful, most incisive. Um, most accurate uh, reporting in regards to uh, both the benefits um, and the dangers of facial uh, recognition technology. Let me ask everyone here whether they open their smartphone by use of their facial recognition. Okay, so man, 40, 50 percent of the room is used to, in some form, facial recognition uh, technology. Um, I should also point out, and to be really fair here, that we're likely to talk about a company in particular, Clearview AI, artificial intelligence. And the reason why we're going to talk about Clearview is not to, you know, bully Clearview uh, or jump Clearview. It's for us to learn about what seems to be the most powerful software and artificial intelligence application around um, facial um, technology. And of course, you know, being big, being powerful means you're going to get scrutiny. Um, and so that's why we'll be talking about uh, Clearview. So, what, about 165 years ago, Justice Brandeis, uh, who was a noted privacy scholar, even at Harvard Law in 1890, wrote a law review article about privacy. He'd later get on the uh, Supreme Court. And of course, in the Olmstead case, uh, declared words that I think many of us agree to, which is freedom actually means the right to be left alone. How many people agree with that? 
Well, enter technology, right? And here we go with our conversation now. Why don't we start off with this concept of um, facial technology? Is it a new concept? I mean, facial recognition technology has been around for a few, you know decades now. Going, you know, they first started trying to develop this automated way of recognizing faces back in, um, you know, 1960s. Uh, police departments have been using facial recognition technology for two decades now. You know, it started in Florida and Pinellas County back in 2000. Um, so it, it goes far back, but facial recognition technology got really good in the last decade thanks to advances in neural net technology. Um, and so it's working better than it ever did before right now. Um, and, and there's a couple of different kinds. There's verification, opening your phone, and then there's this identification of going through a big database and looking for someone. And the reason that Clearview AI has gotten so much attention is that they went and they scraped billions of photos from the public web. Um, they now have 10, over 10 billion photos of people on social media sites, you know, newspaper photos, and created this app that can identify just about anyone. And, and that was, you know, quite a um, quite a dramatic development because before facial recognition had just been applied, at least on, in the government use, um, to people who are in government databases, mugshot photos, driver's license photos. And so that was this big change that's now made people look more closely at facial recognition and where we are today and where we go from here. You mentioned the number, 10 billion images. Um, I think there are about 7.8 billion people in the world. Um, so... You're not saying that every single human being in the world has been captured by uh, some kind of photo, but what you're saying is that there are 10 billion photos, certainly of everyone here, um, out there in the database at Clearview. And it's just a matter of time, frankly, before there are more. Is that fair? That is fair. I mean, I would encourage, I don't know, I don't know what the relationship is between different law enforcement agencies. But certainly, you know, in your states, there are police departments that have Clearview. I mean, if you can go to your local agency and ask them to run a Clearview search on you, I think that you should do it because it's very powerful to see it in action. To see, you know, not just identifying you. It's not just about putting a name to a face. It's about showing you all these photos of yourself on the internet um, that you might not know are there. Uh, photos on Flickr, you know, photos maybe somebody uh, scanned onto the internet from your law school days. Um, what is so powerful, powerful about this kind of facial recognition is not just figuring out who someone is, but being able to associate these online dossiers that have been compiled on us now for, for decades, associating that with your identity. So all the photos of you that are on the internet that don't have your name on them, but you can find now because you're looking by face. And then all the other things that just come with that, you know, the rating systems, um, you know, whether you're in debt or not, um, these things will start to be able to be associated with your face as you move through society if, if we decide to make this more, you know, universally available. Indeed. In your article, Your Face is Not Your Own, you highlight the common uses of, of technology like Clearviews for law enforcement, and you talk about cases like child exploitation case, cases. Um, have, has the technology been successful in these cases and has the technology assisted in the closing of criminal cases? Yeah, I've talked to a lot of, um, a lot of law enforcement officers who have used facial recognition tools and they have, I mean, there are some incredible use cases. I, I wrote in the article about a, um, uh, a, there was child sexual abuse material where they had this photo of a young child being abused and the man's face was kind of briefly visible in the material. Uh, and, you know, you can't often get a lead from something like that, but because of Clearview, they were able to run the man's face and they found one photo of him online, an Instagram photo that wasn't of him. Um, he was in the background of the photo. It was taken at, um, it was taken at a like gym. a, what's that? I think it was a workout facility. Yeah, it was at a, a bodybuilding conference. 
And so then the officer, you know, what, all, what officers always tell me is that facial recognition isn't going to close the case. It's, you know, it's a lead. Uh, and so they contacted the bodybuilding, you know, um, vendor that this guy's standing behind the table. And eventually they're able to get this guy's name and find him. Uh, and, and, and that's the thing about facial recognition. It's, it can be very powerful. Uh, it really can help solve crimes, but it, but it has flaws too. And I just don't think that we have fully thought through, um, fully th thought through those flaws and how it will impact society. Um, bias especially, there just have not been enough studies done about how facial recognition works differently for different demographics. Let's talk about that um, in the criminal context. We've also seen wrongful arrests, wrongful convictions, um, I think in the literature, including your own reporting, there are at least a handful of such cases. They tend to uh, concern uh, people of color, be it Asian, uh, Pacific Islander, and black and brown. Um, has that at all you know, served as a check and balance governmentally in regards to the use of this in law enforcement? Yeah, we... Um, How accurate are they? How accurate are they? So there really has not been enough study of how accurate they are. The best study was done by NIST, which I hadn't really heard of before I started doing facial recognition studies, but um, NIST is you know, the, the scientific lab, the federal agency, and they've been testing facial recognition algorithms dating back to the 90s. And for the first time in 2019, they did this extensive study about how demographics affect facial recognition algorithms. And they found that, um, you know, with one-to-one, -one, with, with verification, um, there were problems with uh, people of color, Asian people, black people, um, the elderly, the young, that there, it, it didn't perform as well on all groups. And with, with, um, identification where you're searching a big database, it didn't work as well on black women. Um, but the thing is, they were just studying mugshots. They were studying, they were studying, you know, mugshot to mugshot, driver's license photo to driver's license photo. And when we're talking about using facial recognition in criminal investigations, we're talking about, you know, an ATM photo, a surveillance camera. Still, these are these photos are not as, you know, good, not as perfect as a mugshot. And we haven't really studied that fully. Um, how bias plays a role there. Um, so, so I can't really, I, I don't think we really know um, how biased there are, but the studies that have been done indicate uh, that there are, there are problems. Um, and certainly and those folks who wrongly arrested and wrongly convicted um, think there are significant problems. Yeah, I don't know of a wrongful conviction yet. There is somebody in Florida who alleges that it was a bad facial recognition match, and he's been trying to fight it for a long time. But I have talked to two black men who were wrongfully arrested based on a bad facial recognition match. Um, and we don't know how many more there are. There's at least one more. Um, strangely, they're all in Detroit. Uh, in Detroit, you were asking about what law enforcement has kind of done in reaction to this. And in Detroit, they put some, they put some restrictions on how they're using facial recognition, that they're only using it for serious crimes and, and really making sure that it is being treated as a tool uh, that assists in the investigation and isn't the, you know, the end all be all in it. And some, some, some cities have banned facial recognition for now. They say, you know, the, the problem of bias is, is, is too big a problem for us to be using this in the criminal justice system right now. And so around Boston, there have been bans um, in the San Francisco area. And they say, you know, basically, yes, we see the usefulness of this, this tool, but we need to fully understand the bias problems first and, and think about the the implications of this new technology that is changing our notions of privacy. Indeed, and Vermont, of course, uh, also passed legislation a few years back um, banning um, the, uh, the technology. Uh, but more recently, there was discussion around exceptions allowing for child exploitation cases, seeing some value there. So the discussion in a real way is just beginning. Um, Clearview AI, kind of a catchy name. Uh, was that its name originally? No, when the, when the company first started, they were, they were called Smart Checker. Smart Checker. Without the, you know, in the, the Tech Valley way, without the 
E with the on the ER. That's how my niece writes it. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Let's uh, let's move a little bit uh, to the social media companies. You mentioned that the way that Clearview gets um, the pictures, the 10 billion uh, plus images, is they scrape. I guess that's what it's called. Um, you know, social media and open internet sites. How have the big technology companies themselves, masters of AI, reacted uh, to what some would say their products being utilized uh, in this uh, facial recognition manner? So they have expressed displeasure, displeasure about it. Um, uh, Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, Venmo, um, which are sites we know have been scraped by Clearview AI, um, they've sent the company cease and desist letters. But that has been the extent of it so far. Um, you know, the, these companies, you know, this is hard to protect against. These companies do not like scrapers generally. Uh, they tend to have technologies that prevent that. They do something called rate limiting, where you can basically see uh, that the same computer is coming to your site over and over again and, and basically you know, downloading photos, copying and pasting information, and you try to block that activity. But scrapers have, you know, it's kind of a cat and mouse game, and they find ways around that. So it is hard for them to perfectly protect users' data. Sure. Um, and, and some of the companies that you mentioned, Google, Facebook, of course, they're, they've got great technology themselves. Is there any information or suggestion or evidence out there that they themselves have considered entering into uh, the facial recognition technology space in a way that Clearview AI has? I mean, these companies already do facial recognition, right? Like, what Facebook... Facebook back in 2010 released something called, um, what was it called, photo tagging or face tagging, where they would tell you, uh, oh, this is your mother, do you want to tag her? You know, this is your, uh, this is your friend, John, do you want to tag him? They had these technologies already. Uh, and I'm sure that a Google or a Facebook could have released a Clearview AI type tool years earlier. Um, Google actually, said back in, I think it was 2011, the chairman, Eric Schmidt, said, this is the one technology that we have developed and we decide to hold back because we think it could be used in a very bad way and in a very good way. So it is something that the technology companies could have done themselves and they basically saw as taboo, which is pretty wild. I mean, when you think of Google and Facebook, you don't think of them as, you know, super conservative when it comes to use of people's data and privacy. So I think that that is really telling. Um, and on scraping, I was just going to point to the fact that there, there's been litigation over this. Yes. Um, there was a company called HiQ that was scraping LinkedIn, um, and they would they basically uh, sold this service to companies where they could say, "Hey, we can let you know when your employees are thinking about leaving." Um, they uh, and they did that by basically you know scraping LinkedIn and looking at who had the fact that they're looking for a new job and, and stuff like that. And so LinkedIn sued them and said, you know, you can't, you can't scrape us. It's, you know, a violation of, you know, our protected material. And that case went to the Ninth Circuit. Uh, and LinkedIn lost. Uh, the Ninth Circuit found that, you know, this is kind of publicly available material and there is a right to scrape. Um, and so that decision actually came down, you know, while Clearview was, or Smart Checker was in the midst of scraping people's photos. And so they were pretty happy about that, um, that it said what they were doing was not legally wrong. Um, and that is something that's kind of still undetermined, uh, the legality of scraping, um, among the many other things that are undetermined here. Right, uh, TJ uh, II, uh, over there, uh, the Attorney General from Vermont, mentioned that the law is behind the yes. technology. Um, I know you're not a lawyer, but you certainly know law. There's a 1986 um, fraud and computer uh, access law. Uh, what's your sense as to whether that applies, the federal law? I mean, that is part of what LinkedIn tried to use in this high Q case, and that failed. Um, that I think just because of the, 
this is information that's displayed publicly. Um, and Clearview always makes that distinction. They said, you know, we're not logging into Facebook and getting access to private photos. We're not scraping places that you that anyone can't see. We are just like Google. Um, we are like Google crawling the web. And Google goes out and goes to everybody else's websites and gets their images, and so that you can do a Google image search and you can look for General Carl Racine and you know see all the images of yourself that are on lots of different sites. Clearview says that's exactly what we're doing. We're doing what Google does, except instead of searching for Carl Racine, you can take a photo of yourself and see all the images out there on different sites. And so that is, you know, that's a powerful that's a powerful argument, I think. Um, yeah, and, <laughs> and so obviously we're talking about federal legislation. That's old, 1986. Um, what is the state of federal legislation uh, that would, um, you know, would, would tackle the issues related to facial recognition today? I mean, I keep seeing bills kind of get um, floated uh, around facial recognition. Some people calling for a moratorium for, for studying it. Um, some people calling for a ban. Some people kind of, some people looking to, I mean, so Illinois is the state to look to for, um, for a, a bill, for a law that affects facial recognition because they have the Biometric Information Privacy Act. And this is quite a distinct law. Two other states have kind of a version of it, but it's, it's the strongest in Illinois because of the, um, the private, um, Sorry, I'm gonna uh, the right to private sure. action. Um, That's right. <laughs> and we have the uh, the former Illinois Attorney General with us, our great friend Lisa Madigan. Um, so we may have a question from Lisa later. <laughs> the Illinois law is particularly interesting because it's it's an old law. It's a 2008 law. In 2008, and it gives people um, the the gives people the power to decide whether their biometrics get used or so not consent. by private companies. Consent. Affirmative consent. And so this has really been the biggest problem for Clearview AI is the existence of this law. And that's where they're being sued. Uh, there's a bunch of class actions that have been um, consolidated in Illinois. There's a state lawsuit filed by the ACLU, and that's, that's what they're fighting is, is this law, the fact that they didn't get consent from Illinois residents. They've now gotten Illinois residents, or they've tried to get them out of their database. They're not operating in Illinois. Uh, but I think that's the big question is yeah, uh, whether BIPA is the way to address face recognition or not. Right, uh, but uh, w from what you know and what you've reported, the Illinois law has caught the company's attention and at least they're trying as best they can, or at least what, that's what they say, uh, to not have uh, residents of Illinois' images in their database. So it could be a starting point uh, for other states that are similarly concerned uh, in regards to the use of facial recognition without people's consent. And in, in California, of course, with their big um, privacy law, people who live in California can contact Clearview AI and have their photos deleted from their database. Interesting. Um, so that's another law that, that applies. Okay. So we've been talking a lot about Clearview AI uh, and facial uh, recognition technology generally in the government space and specifically criminal space. I, w I do want to move over to the potential um, corporate space and commercialization of it. But before we go there, facial recognition technology is also powerful overseas and being utilized by countries like Russia uh, and China. Can you talk a bit about how those countries are using uh, AI, specifically facial recognition AI? Yeah, um, I haven't, so this part I haven't directly reported on as much, so I'm, um, I have to rely on other people's reporting, but, you know, China and Russia are pretty far ahead of us in terms of the deployment of facial recognition. Um, uh, Russia, for example, they had a kind of clear view AI type app come out back in 2016. It was called Find Face, and it was publicly available. Um, and it was based on, they had scraped uh, a, a social networking site called VK, which is like Facebook. And people could download the app and start using it. And so people went on the subway, they identified strangers. Um, 
harassers, you know, went took the the faces of um, porn stars, sex workers, identified them, started harassing them and their families. Um, it was used to identify people at anti-government protests, and the company eventually took the app down. Um, and didn't make it publicly available, but they did sell it to governments and um, to businesses. And now their technology is deployed in surveillance cameras um, around different Russian cities. And so they can do real-time facial recognition. They can find people who there's a warrant out for their arrest, um, or it uh, has been reported that it was used during the pandemic, that people that were supposed to be quarantining, if they left their apartment, it would basically flag um, that they were they were outside when they were not supposed to be, and one one guy said he took out his trash, and then the police came to his door and asked why he'd been you know out of his apartment while he was supposed to be quarantining, and so when I look at what's happening in Russia and China, I mean it seems like a possible future, depending on what we decide about what we do in facial re with fac facial rec recognition in the U.S. Um, but yes, it is quite. It's um, quite advanced in its deployment um, there already. And indeed, in China, there's reporting out there that the Chinese authorities have been using the technology in regards to the persecution of the Uyghurs, uh, that's the Muslim uh, followers, uh, in China. And so, yes, there is a real concern around government misuse, albeit more specifically uh, abroad, um, though problems have been noted. And in, in China, they're doing something, uh, you know, facial recognition, but there's other kinds of facial technologies. And so one thing that was reported, reportedly being done in China is that they've developed face recognition that can basically identify whether you are, you know, a Uyghur Muslim. And so there can be an alert that, a, you know, a person of this ethnicity has, you know, entered, you know, entered the premises. And so that is, um, that's, that's troubling in, in its own way. Uh, to say the least, indeed. Let's talk a little bit about um, corporate use and worst case scenarios and dig in a little bit more about Clearview AI. Um, who founded the technology uh, that is now Clearview AI? Um, so Clearview AI was founded, I've, I've gotten kind of different stories on this from the company. Originally my understanding is that it was founded by a man named Richard Schwartz um, who was kind of a uh, Politico media consultant. He had uh, been a deputy to Rudy Giuliani when he was mayor of New York. Uh, and an, a technologist named Juan Tan Tat, who was from Australia, had moved to the U.S. when he was 19 to work in California and Silicon Valley making Facebook games and apps. And then he moved to New York and they met and they developed the company that became Clearview AI. Um, later I found out there was a third person that was involved in the founding um, named Charles Johnson or Chuck Johnson who is a very controversial figure um, kind of associated with the alt-right um, and that when you know when it was first kind of conceived he told me it was about kind of identifying liberals that it would be they all met um, he and Tantat had met because of being in those circles. They both really liked Trump. They like went to the uh, RNC convention and we were thinking this would be a good way to be able to identify liberals who are kind of like sneaking in here. Um, and so that is, you just, uh, it was a surprising kind of origin story. And the company, the company says that this isn't, there's, there seems to be like quite a, quite a disagreement between the company and Chuck Johnson now, um, though he still does have some equity in the company according to corporate filings I was able to track down. And who's Peter Thiel? Peter Thiel was the first investor in what um, what was then called Smart Checker and became Clearview AI. It was a very small amount for a billionaire like Peter Thiel. It was like what you might spend on a latte. Um, he gave them $200,000. Um, I'll take a latte. <laughs> But Peter Thiel, you know, he is, uh, he started PayPal, he made a fortune investing early on in Facebook, he helped found Palantir. I mean, he is a person that really understands the value of people's data. Um, and so it, yeah, it may, perhaps not surprising that he was a backer of a company like this. Indeed. And, you know, you mentioned uh, 
the political aspect, I think I've read in your writings two points. Number one, uh, that this facial recognition technology has been shopped to political folks, people running campaigns, um, perhaps to be used in opposition research uh, and the like. Tell us about that. Do we know whether campaigns are actually using facial recognition for uh, campaign purposes? So in, in the early days of Smart Checker, they didn't know what they were going to do with the tool that they are creating. Um, and originally, it was not just about face. It was also about searching somebody's email. Um, but they thought about selling it to grocery stores. They did a pilot in Cristedes Market, which is in New York. Uh, they were selling it, trying to sell it to real estate firms that so you can kind of have it in the lobby and identify people who are coming in. Um, and originally the company tried to pitch their technology to politicians that were um, campaigning. One was a woman named Holly Lynch who was running as a Democrat in New York. Another was Paul Nealon um, who was running in, I believe, Wisconsin, who later, you know, came out pretty explicitly as a um, kind of white supremacist, um, uh, or at least white supremacy friendly. Uh, and the, the the version that they were selling to them, Paul Nealon never talked to me, but Holly Lynch said it didn't have anything to do with facial recognition. It was just about this kind of tool that would tell you more about voters based on their social media. Um, but you could, I mean, certainly imagine very uh, useful ways to use it for campaigns. As far as I know, there are no um, political uses of face recognition right now, and, and certainly not of Clearview AI, but um, there's a lot in the world I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for sure. Um, I, I can tell you that I've had an interaction uh, with uh, Clearview AI. Uh, they sought, um, I think, a meeting, I don't know if it was virtual, uh, Jason, or not, uh, with us, uh, and um, they gave us an overview of their technology. I believe Mr. Schwartz uh, was present. Uh, and I believe that the um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Tot uh, was also um, present. And specifically, what they really wanted to communicate was how their technology was being utilized to identify um, the mob uh, at the insurrection on January 6. Um, and again, making that strong law enforcement pitch. I'm sure uh, that they've reached out to other AG. In did that they, regard as well. Did they do a demo for you? I don't remember. Mm -hmm. No. But let's talk about a demo because yeah. you and your reporting, working sources, asked uh, that your face be run on their database. Tell us about that. Well, when I first started reporting on Clearview AI, um, I'd heard about it. They'd shown up in a, a public records um, search that a researcher had been doing about how police departments were using facial recognition. And this company, Clearview AI, showed up. And they had a, a legal memo they were giving to police departments that was written by Paul Clement, uh, the former US Solicitor General, explaining why this tool was actually legal to use, that they wouldn't be breaking the law by searching someone's face using Clearview AI. Um, and so I was like, oh, this sounds like nothing I've heard of before. I tried to get in touch with the company. They wouldn't talk to me. Um, no one would respond to my emails. They had a they had an address on their website, and when I went there, it was a couple blocks away from the New York Times office. The building didn't exist. Uh, it was it was a very odd. They were in hiding. They say it was just because they were in stealth mode as a startup, but it was very strange for me as a reporter. I'd never quite had that experience before, and so I I started um, trying to find police departments that were using it, so I could talk to police officers and see whether this thing actually worked. And I talked to a financial crimes detective in Gainesville, and he was very excited to talk about it. He said he wished they could be, he could be their spokesman, that it was amazing, that he had you know, a, dozens of cases uh, fi from uh, photos where he hadn't been able to get a lead checking state facial recognition databases, and that he ran the photos through Clearview AI, and all of a sudden he was identifying these people. Um, and I said, well, you know, I'd really like to see how this works myself. And um, he says, oh, yeah, I'd love to run a search of your face. Just send me a photo. Uh, and so I did. And then he stopped talking to me. Um, and I would, I would email him. I called him. And I couldn't get him to respond. So I was talking to another investigator in Texas who wasn't quite as big a fan of Clearview AI, but said it worked really well as long as you had, like, a, somebody who was on the Internet. 
And I was like, oh, I talked to this other guy and he never got back to me, but, and he's like, oh, I'll run your face. And so he runs it and he says, oh, there weren't any results. And I was like, that's so weird. There's a lot of photos of me on the internet. And he goes, yeah, it's really weird. Maybe like their server's down or something. Um, and then he stopped talking to me. <laughs> so then I find a third guy and, and he, I tell him about how this happened. He goes, okay, well, let me check. And he checks, and he says, yeah, you don't have any results. It's so weird. And then a couple of minutes later, Clearview AI calls him and says, hey, you know, this is uh, Clearview. And the company calls the law enforcement officer. Calls this detective. And um, they're like, oh, you know, we have some questions. You know, why are you running the photo of a, of a New York Times reporter? And he's like, oh, I did? And they go, yeah, Kashmir Hill, do you know her? And he's just like, oh, I don't, how would I, how would I know? He was a little bit cagey. Um, <laughs> but they said, you know, you're, you're not supposed to do that. You know, you shouldn't be, you know, talking to the media about Clearview AI. And it was stunning to me because this company wasn't talking to me, but they had flagged my face in their app and they had blocked my face from having results. And that I found very, um, I just found that so alarming that you have this private company that you know kind of has access to everyone that law enforcement is looking for. That's that's you know quite powerful. Um, but I you know that's this kind of larger issue of the way private companies are um, assisting government agencies. But yeah, that was quite a, a strange start to the story of telling. Um, clear. Uh, so we got about right. eight minutes and yeah. twenty seconds or so. I wonder if you can just delineate or list some of the grave concerns around more than just the government use, but corporations um, monetizing this app and using facial recognition technology. Yeah, I mean, I think it is, when I think about facial recognition um, and the usefulness it could have, the utility in society, you know, I could imagine this being released more widely to the world. I mean, you certainly are already seeing it in airports, um, airlines kind of letting people use their facial re their face to check in. Um, a lot of us use facial recognition all the time with our phones. I can just see the way it might creep into so society more broadly. Um, you know, I, I imagine that we could all have an app like Clearview available to, available to us at some point, um, that we might have it on our phones, uh, that we would use it on each other. And that would just completely change our sense of anonymity in the world. That you, if you're in a restaurant and you're having a juicy conversation and you're able to do that because you just assume that the people around you have no idea who you are, uh, with the Clearview app, they could just run your face and now they understand the context of the conversation. Mm. Um, that I find yeah, you know, almost more, you know, one of the more more chilling ways that it could be used. Um, at the same time, as a reporter, I would love to have access to a tool like this. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, this is the thing about privacy. We, we, you know, vigorously want to protect our own, but we love ways to invade <laughs> other people's. But, like, for a reporter, if there was some kind of event and there's people standing around and you weren't there, but now you can identify those people and go and interview them, um, you know, it's a useful power, uh, but it would be quite chilling to not be able to just walk down a city street, um, to, to think of the way, uh, I, I, you know, I've, I've written before about people who, um, who basically have interactions with strangers where they get very upset at them and they try to destroy their lives, um, you know, go online and destroy their online reputation. And I just think about the way that these slights could blow up. You know, you're on the bus or you're on the subway with somebody. You bump into somebody. You have angry words and all of a sudden they can know who you are and, you know, write horrible things about you online. I, I just imagine, you know, there are positive cases, there are negative cases. Um, every technology humans get, we, we use it for good and we use it for evil. And so, um, indeed. And you know, you're not to mention, of course, uh, the proliferation of social media and kids and, you know, the fact that kids like taking pictures of themselves and their friends, you can imagine 
uh, how that might be used in the wrong hands. We got about five minutes or so left uh, for audience questions. Let me first uh, invite the attorneys general uh, to chime in if they've got uh, any questions or comments. Tish, I'm going to give you a mic. So I was in the Berkshires recently, um, enjoying a dinner by myself um, and watching a football game. Um, and it was an innocent interaction. The gentlemen to my right were having a private bet as to whether or not that was Letitia James. <laughs> they did a facial recognition and then they came over to me with the phone and said, you are Letitia James. I just bet my friend and I won $25 or whatever we did, you know, we took a picture of you and there you are. And then they went on to do a, ask me a, a series of questions. It was scary. Um, it was somewhat alarming. It was innocent then, um, but in uh, the hands of individuals who may want to do you harm, um, it could be somewhat threatening. Um, so my question really is um, racial recognition and the biases associated with the algorithms. And the fact that the accuracy rate, they claim um, when we did meet with Clearview that the accuracy rate was over 90%, they claim, or about 90%. But when you inject race into it, gender, age, the accuracy rate goes down. And so as was mentioned by A.J. Racine, very much concerned about the use of algorithms, particularly in the criminal justice space. And if you can speak a little bit more to that, um, that would be greatly appreciated. But again, I personally experienced it, um, and it was somewhat alarming um, in that particular incident. It was innocent, it was harmless, um, but clearly um, in the wrong hands, obviously, um, it poses some concerns. Yeah, I mean, the problem with the technology that has made facial recognition so, so good now is that it's neural net technology. And neural net technology, uh, they, technologists kind of talk about it as a black box technology because you have, uh, I'm trying to think of the simplest way to describe, you just have like um, layers of computer programming that you feed a bunch of data into it and give it the right answers and it basically figures out how to perform face recognition because you give it a whole bunch of photos of the same person and um, it figures out how to analyze it. And when something goes wrong with this technology, it's hard for them to fix it because it's all this like layers of computer programming they can't just see where it went wrong um, and make sure that, that formula is right. So once you get the bias, baked in, it can be very hard to take it out. Um, uh, and we really, we, we really haven't had enough studies done on this. And a lot of technologists don't even understand where the bias really comes from. You know, uh, is it the training data? Was it trained on a bunch of photos of white people and there just wasn't enough diversity in the data that they fed into the program? Or is it cameras themselves, which have been optimized to take photos of white skin and not you know, brown skin or black skin? Um, it, it is hard to kind of figure out where in this process the bias creeped in and so then it is hard to take it out. Um, I actually wanted to ask you about that, generally seen, because I, 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 hey, wait a second. I've That's heard you rule. might have. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that you might have some kind of bill for um, requiring companies to to figure this out to um, to analyze their own algorithms for bias, and I'm I'm curious how how that might work. Will it be a feature in the Sunday Times? <laughs> <laughs> I've got my notebook. <laughs> no, the fact is that the District of Columbia, our terrific office, has been working uh, with experts, uh, particularly at Georgetown University, privacy experts uh, that you're familiar with, um, and civil rights groups, uh, and we are close uh, to finalizing an Algorithmic Fairness and Transparency Act uh, for the District of Columbia. We're not going to uh, put it out there until we fully vetted it. There are a lot of, of issues and concerns, and of course you want to be fair. Um, but I can tell you that we've gotten really good input uh, from uh, the corporate community, uh, and we think uh, we're going to we're on pace uh, to moving that forward, and should be interesting. To Attorney General James's point, the algorithms themselves have problems. Uh, there is no doubt about that. They oftentimes rely on age-old bias. Uh, 
on and they put it into some kind of computer language and act as if that's objective criteria. It's not. It's based on human bias that has been going on for a long time. So there are significant issues there. The other point uh, that uh, Attorney General James raises is who's being surveyed. The District of Columbia, in the latest census data, 2020, uh, reported that the population of African Americans in the District of Columbia uh, significantly dropped over the last 30 years, up down from about 82% in the District of Columbia to 41% estimated uh, in 2020. I can tell you that in the District of Columbia, in regards to juveniles arrested and coming into uh, my office, 96% of the kids are black, brown kids. I can also tell you, it ain't because, um, with all due respect to my white brothers and others, it's not because they're not violating law. Uh, it's because the government is focused uh, on particular communities of color. Uh, so algorithms are problematic as well as who the focus of surveillance uh, mm -hmm. is on. I often joke about the times in Wall Street, uh, you know, the big financial crisis, 07, 08, 09. Boy, what if they all of a sudden allowed for stop and frisk of any banker with a briefcase <laughs> under the theory that you stole money <laughs> from grandmothers and grandfathers? Um, I'm sure there'd be an uproar. Um, at any rate, these are fascinating issues. I'm going to take a Vermont privilege here and go a couple more minutes. Are there any other attorneys general uh, who want to ask a question? And I'll expand that to former uh, AG, and then we'll go out to the audience. Thank you, and thank you for being here today. Um, thank you, General, and, and thank you, Tish, for sharing your story. Um, and what I took from that story is, in that instance, though scary, they got it right, you are Tish James, but for all of us, and I'm sure you've had this experience who are people of color, um, we are often routinely mistaken for other people, right, who are our same race and gender, and I'm routinely mistaken for other Asian American elected officials, and there aren't that many of us, to be very candid, and it happens all the time. Um, and so this is very scary that, that even though that's human error, that the bias is built in um, could result in machine error. I actually also had a meeting with Clearview. It was a more casual meeting at an event, and one of the founders came up to me with his phone and said, I've got this great technology. Let me show it to you. And we're literally like at an event cocktail party. And then he wanted to give me a demo on the fly. And that just was beyond creepy that he had this power in his hand and he wanted to demonstrate it you know, on the fly in a cocktail party. And that seemed to be literally in one person's hand a great deal of power, more power than, than frankly I had encountered in this space. So with those observations, my question to you is, we've identified the problems. I think we're here to try to figure out what do we do about this. And so in your travels in talking to government officials, regulators, deep thinkers about a regulatory infrastructure rules, laws, is there something um, that you've come across, a bill or an idea or a regulator commentator who said something that, that resonates with you about how we approach this problem from our regulatory and law enforcement perspective in trying to keep people safe and protect their privacy? You know, I haven't, I, I don't encounter a lot of people that have the answer, because um, I do think it's so complicated. Um, right now, there's kind of a knee-jerk reaction, which is just ban it, um, and, and some places have. But it is, I, I think bans are difficult, given that it can help to solve crimes. Um, that it, it might make it possible to solve a crime that you otherwise couldn't solve, that uh, you know, that alone makes it difficult to do a full ban. Um, I, you know, a lot of people point to BIPA, um, and BIPA is kind of useful for 
the regulation of private use of facial recognition. There's an exemption for, for government use in BIPA. Um, I, you know, with so many privacy problems, it often comes down to consent. Um, and maybe this is fine as long as you opt in. You know, what if there's some big facial recognition, you know, app network and we all, we all enter it and you can have different settings so that, you know, your friends can recognize you or friends of friends can recognize you or anyone can recognize you. Um, there just aren't often easy ways to solve privacy problems, um, especially under the framework of existing laws, which just didn't anticipate these kinds of technologies existing. So um, I, haven't, I haven't figured out the solution yet. I mean, I hope I do, because <laughs> I'm working on a book about this, and I'd like to... Coming out you know. soon, Random House <laughs> publication. <laughs> I'd love to end it with the answers, but I do think it's, it's just very difficult. I, I often, you know, I, I've thought a lot about um, caller ID, that when caller ID first came out, some people thought of it as a privacy invasion, that when you called somebody, you would be identified, um, that we should have a kind of anonymity when we call people, and how quickly that shifted. That the idea now, when you get a call from like an unknown number or a block number, it's, it's annoying. You want to know who's calling you. And so I, I can, I think it's possible we could have that shift potentially around facial, facial recognition, where we have the expectation that you can recognize someone. I just think it's hard to anticipate how um, societal attitudes are going to change. Um, but yeah, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have like a, a simple answer to that. It's complicated for sure. And I think, quite honestly, we could have a four-day conference on this issue. There's no doubt about it. Um, so we're going to end here. Really want to thank uh, Kashmir Hill uh, for her extraordinary work uh, and willingness to uh, meet with this group. Thank you very much.